We have a lively crowd today. I love it. We're all ready for the weekend. Um, so we are going to go ahead and call to order, and we're going to start with our safety debrief with Gregory. Morning. Good morning. Um, first off, in the event, I uh, just want to go over a safety debrief this morning. In the event of a fire alarm or a need for evacuation, our primary evacuation route is through that door right behind you and straight out the hallway um, through the doors to the parking lot on the back side. And we would meet in the evacuation zone, which is right by the street corner of the parking lot right there. Um, if that area is blocked off from the fire, then we would go out the door right here and use the stairs, not the elevator, to go out the front entrance. And again, the evacuation zone is in the parking lot right there. Um, in the event of a medical emergency, is there anyone here who is CPR certified? Raise your hand. <laughs> Got a couple. Great. Um, we have a automatic um, AED defibrillator also located downstairs. Um, to use the defibrillator, all you have to do is turn on the device and it will tell you, give you instructions. Of course, the people who are CPR certified will also be involved in, in helping the person to try to get them um, revived. And of course, someone at if that does occur, um, someone should be calling 911 so that if someone can come in, uh, the police and the emergency services can come. Um, in the event of an active shooter, um, there are three things that Department of Homeland Security uh, would like to remind people to what to do. The first thing is run. So uh, it's as, as weird as that sounds, run, right? So wherever the sounds of the gunshots are, go the opposite direction and try to get outside get to a place as far away from the active shooter as possible. Second is to hide. So if you cannot run for whatever reason, wherever you're blocked off, hide, garrison yourself in the building, uh, whatever you need to do to try to prevent the active shooter from hearing you. Um, and then if you cannot do that, then the last resort is to fight. So throw whatever you can, take your chairs, whatever, <laughs> at the active shooter, whatever you need to do. Hopefully that never happens, of course. Uh, last but not least, and there's a lot of other things we can talk about, but in the event of an earthquake, obviously here in Santa Cruz, uh, the first thing to do is, is uh, do not exit the building during the earthquake, but go to underneath the tables for, for the directors. If you don't have a table nearby, the safest spot is actually near the walls um, of the of the building. Not, don't want to be in the middle of the building because if it collapses, the walls can kind of keep um, everything there. Um, and then of course, once the earthquake is over, and it seems to be clear, then you evacuate. Um, again, the quickest path of evacuation is through those doors and straight out the door, um, straight through the hallway. You'll see the entrance on the other side. And of course, you can go down the stairs right here. And whatever you do, do not use an elevator, of course, in those type of situations. All right, thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item three. I believe uh, before we do a roll call that we have an AB2449 uh, just cause circumstance today. Yes, that's correct. Hi, it's Rebecca. I'm uh, participating using the just cause circumstance. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, can we have a roll call, please? Director Brown? Here. Director Downey? Here. Director Dutra? Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Present. Director Koenig? Here. Director Lynn? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Newsom? Present. Director Pagler? Here. Director Key Rose Carter? Director Rockin? Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt? Here. Ex officio Director Riskin? Here. And we have four. Great. Uh, we'll move on to announcements. I'll start by uh, sharing that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Language Line Services is providing Spanish interpretation, which will be available during oral communications and for any other agenda item for which these services are needing, needed. And we have uh, Hector Guzman. Hi. Yes. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Hector, and then I, I will be providing Spanish interpretation for any item on the agenda. And if you need assistance, please let the board know. Um, hola, mi nombre es Hector. Um, Y yo soy un intérprete de inglés español. Si hay alguien que necesite asistencia con cualquier artículo en la agenda, por favor, dejarle a la mesa directiva. Dejarle a la mesa directiva, perdón. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll go now to board of directors comments. Are there any directors with comments today? All right, I will just share briefly uh, at last week's, I think it was last week's uh, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments meeting, the AMBAG board uh, voted to approve funding for Metro's uh, 90X route between Washington and Santa Cruz. So it's just an exciting um, outcome of the vote of the AMBAG board. I just wanted to share that. And I think, Rebecca, did you have your hand up? I apologize if I missed you. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, a friend of mine who is a regular always bus rider has no car. And she commented to me the other day how much civility has been lost in recent years. And she said that our bus operators create an island of civility on every bus ride. And she just wanted to thank Metro for hiring great drivers and everyone seems to just behave a little bit differently on the bus with a little more decorum and it makes for a very enjoyable ride. So please thank all the drivers. Absolutely, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, if there's no further comments from directors, we'll move on to oral and, uh, oral and written communications to the board of directors. It looks like we have uh, two written communications, uh, emails with responses from Metro. Uh, and no additional communications were received. Do we have any oral communications this morning for items not on today's agenda? Good morning. Good morning, um, Eduardo Montesino. I just wanted to update you where we're at um, uh, between the hirings. You know, we have a, uh, we have a tall order, um, you know, that, that we needed to achieve, and we're almost there. Um, we've, uh, we've interviewed and recruited, over, you know, over 300 people. Uh, we've hired uh, uh, like 105, 110, you know, um, but it's all to the uh, work of working together uh, between HR staff, you know, uh, the training department, and, you know, and, and people that, that I do really want to acknowledge is the supervisory group, you know, um, um, Araceli Campos, Juan, uh, Juan Castillo, Juan Rodriguez, uh, Jose Valtierra, and, and Lanea, um, um, amongst others, because they've been helping the training department uh, outside their duties and, and coming on their days off to help, you know, with all, uh, with all the training. Um, because we're, you know, uh, like I said, it was a tall order, but we're, we're getting it done. Um, we're in, uh, almost uh, to the last class that's going to come in, hopefully Jen, um, June 12th, I think it is, that's, gonna, that's coming. And so we'll be fully staffed here, the numbers that we need by, by um, and fully trained by Paul for the service enhancements. So thank you. Uh, do we have any further oral communications online? No? Okay, then we will move on to labor organization communications. Any comments today? Nothing. All right. Uh, any additional documentation to support existing agenda items? There are none. All right, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Any items uh, carry on consent <laughs> will be considered in one motion. Uh, do we have any questions about consent or any items that wish to be pulled before I go to public comment? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on our consent? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll have to do a roll call because we have uh, Rebecca online. Okay. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Paper? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. And we in motion passes. Great. We'll go now to item 10, a presentation of Employee Longevity Award for Frederico Rocha. I believe uh, Freddie's not here, correct? But we do have a bio for him, so I will uh, share that. Uh, Freddie grew up in the counties of Santa Cruz and Monterey. He joined Metro in 2004 as a mechanic one and quickly moved up the ranks to lead, supervisor, superintendent, assistant maintenance manager, and is currently in the position of facilities maintenance manager. Freddie has volunteered his time over the years to the community by coaching several sports teams for middle schools and leagues. He has worked with Watsonville High School's automotive program over the years, providing mentorship to students interested in an automotive or diesel career. 
Freddie was part of the introduction of CNG vehicles to Metro and hopes to stick around until we introduce hydrogen vehicles to Metro. Freddie is thankful for the support he's received over the years from supervisors, managers, COOs, and CEOs that provided him with educational opportunities to advance his career. He is also thankful for the great staff that he has worked with and supported him over the years, including custodians, facility workers, vehicle service workers, detailers, upholsterers, mechanics, and all of the administrative staff. Margo adds that her experience working with Freddie during the last four years has been a delight. Freddie has been invaluable to her as an employee and as head of facilities maintenance. There is no task too small or large for him and his team. During COVID, the, during the COVID pandemic, Freddie and his team took on the monumental task of keeping the administrative and public buildings safe. They were inventive and responsive to the multiple requests and pivoted each time they were faced with a new challenge. Freddie is the epitome of a team player who is willing to assist all departments in every capacity and has a willingness to learn and explore new technology. Freddie, thank you for your 20 years of service. It has been an honor to work with you, and Metro is extremely lucky to have you as a member of our staff. Give a round of applause. All right, and uh, before we move on, I see um, Director Kiros Carter has joined us as well. Good morning. Do I need to confirm um, just calling by emergency, emergency uh, no, no, she was under the traditional rules. Her address is on. Sounds good. Great. All right. Uh, we are now on to item 11, a retiree resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any public comments on the presentation of Employee Longevity Award? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to item 11, a retiree resolution of appreciation for John Fuentes, bus operator. Do we have uh, John here today? Do not. We do not. Okay. Uh, well, then uh, we will make sure that he gets his plaque and yeah. We okay. need an action for this. Uh, yes, I believe we will. I just wanted to make sure we don't have any public comments. And we do not. A uh, bio was provided, right? I'm sorry. We didn't receive a bio. We don't have a bio. Yeah. No, but we will make sure that he gets um, his his plaque and his resolution of appreciation. Okay. Sorry. Move approval by Director Pegler and seconded by Director Rotkin. Uh, point roll call, please. <coughs> Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. <coughs> Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colentary Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Kibros Carter? Aye. And Director Rotkin? Aye. Motion passes. Great. All right. Uh, we were we are moving on to the uh, item of the day, the review and recommended approval of Santa Cruz Metro's draft fiscal year 25 and 26 operating budgets and 25 capital budget. Morning, Craig. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm basically opening up the public comment period by going through the FY25 budget. 26 plan, which is basically our budget for review. Um, I'm going to go through these slides. I'm not going to reiterate everything that we went through in March. I'm going to highlight more so those items that have changed since March till now. <clears throat> this is the original yeah. lockdown that we went from operating surplus from 24 budget to 25 budget. This was presented in March, all the changes. So effectively, we have only changed from 24 to 25 by 70,000. Yeah. But since then, things have changed. There's been a couple of items and updates. So moving on, uh, what we presented in March is about $7.4 million in operating surplus. We've actually had some adjustments and some salaries, some increased legal costs. Specifically, we moved our facilities master plan that we need to do this from 24 to 25. It was in the 24 budget, now we're putting in the 25 because we're just going through the RFP process and figuring out who's gonna be doing it. So that's what's in. And then some all other where we added in some training, which is basically the hydrogen training, so forth. And then offset down below our sales tax. We know that our sales tax right now is flat. It's not going up. So initially we actually had a, a increase uh, in the March, um, in the March presentation, that we thought year over year we had a slight increase, we've taken it out. So that's why you see the nine hundred thousand coming out. 
we're now flat uh, from March uh, from 24 bu uh, budget to this budget. Now. So that's what we're seeing. And then we have, of course, with the training of the TERSA for the hydrogen coming over, we have the offset, which is in three quarters. So net net, we're actually about $1.7 million lower, but we're still 5.7 million positive, at least before we transfer money into our buckets. Visually, this is what's happening. So from our 24 to 25 budget, so we're um, moving from, this is operating, uh, operating deficit. So we're at 51.7. So this is passenger revenues, less all the expenses for the agency. Uh, 51.7, our passenger fares are down. FY24 assumed that we had, um, we didn't have the free fares for use, whereas here we actually do. And that's why it's because we're planning to have the free fares for kids. Uh, fully loaded wages, again, we actually ended up giving people pay raises and colas. And, and of course, benefits are extremely high, higher than what we expected. But that's the 1.2. And then on the non personnel cost, we had put in a lot of marketing activities, a consultant's coming in here, and ultimately that was for 24, and it's not in 25. So a lot of that goes away. That's why you're seeing the difference. So just kind of visually looking at it from a PL perspective, as you can see, the passenger fare piece at the top, uh, the biggest driver there for 24 to 25 is the youth free piece. So that's why it's lower. And then moving down, big savings in the non personnel again is like I said, a lot of the consulting spend and so forth that was in 24 is no longer in 25. Then we get to the non operating expense. Uh, the biggest thing here is the fact that we're just slightly lower, but it's all driven by our grants. COVID and federal grants need to be combined together to kind of fully understand. We run out of our COVID grants in 24, and then we revert back to our 5307 grants in 25. So effectively, the real difference is we're a little bit lower on our 50, 5307 grants. It's just a function of, of how we apply the grants against the cost. So it's not that we lose money or we're getting less money. It's just the fact that it's just a function of it. So net net, it's one point eight million dollar difference. This change, uh, these are the uh, personnel pieces that we went from unfunded to funded. This has not changed since March. It's three thirty one to three thirty one, um, and like I said, this is, hasn't changed whatsoever. And then the drivers, the non-operating, as you can see, you see the federal state grants and COVID grants, you see it's so much higher in the federal part, much lower in the COVID, COVID goes away. But if you really combine the two, if we didn't have this kind of in-year change, uh, then that we're a little bit lower. Like I said, we still get the absolute amount of money on the federal side. It's just, we're just, we're just not applying it to the P&L at this point. Um, and then the rest are a couple of little pieces, knit nats. Um, UAL is a little bit worse, only for the fact that uh, CalPERS didn't have the return that we expected. And so we have to kind of make up for that sliver of money. And then net, uh, all net uh, revenue and expense is interest. 24, we didn't plan for all the all these interest rate hikes to come up, so our money's earning interest, and that's what we're now for phase one, phase two, and um, looks at it, just like I said in March, we talked about base over base. I didn't show you base over base. So this is so apples to apples as in phase one, phase two, and zero fares is four. And for all those new, we're no longer calling it free fares. We're going to call it zero fares. So here in the FY24 budget, now we move to the base, phase I presented, which is the second column to the left. And then phase one, phase two, the impact is $10.3 million in the FY23 budget. We're offsetting that with the TERSA funding. And then the zero fare piece is $3.7 million. So zero fares, the way we have set up the budget, is 10 months in FY25 and two months in FY26 for a full year, starting in September, going through August of the next year. So... Uh, right now, we're coming in at about $65 million or about $14 million worse in cost 
But like I said, that's being offset by our TARSA grant. That's the biggest key. And then just phase one, phase two, this is the impact for FY25 and FY26, the 10.3 million for, for 25, and then it jumps to about 11.5 million in 26. And then it's offset by the church silver. And it's primarily, it's all people and fuel. And what you see is the passenger fares. Of course, if we run more service, we get some passenger fares too as well. And then on the zero fares right now, again, 10 months in 25, two months in 26, we eliminate our, of course, passenger fares and some of our special transit fares. And then that's offset by the fact that we don't have to pick up cash. So we don't have guardian services. So that's the elimination of kind of, let's say, the non-personnel piece. And that's offset by the grant. And that's about $4.5 million for the year for a 12-month period. And then the biggest piece, as we kind of go through this, I'm going to go back here. Keep going. All right, there we go. At the very bottom of this page, where it says operating surplus deficit, we go from 7.5 to 6.8. So you can think of that as profit before transfers. So we actually take that money and we end up transferring it to these various buckets. And it's critical because that money is critical for us to kind of go forward to do capital projects, make sure we have reserves in case things happen. So our capital and bus replacement fund, we put $3 million aside every year for mandate. And as part of it, $2.3 million comes from our PL. And then we, as part of the grant, we actually get another about 700,000 that comes at straight to capital. So we put that money aside. That's actually to help pay for buses, our matching portion of our buses. If we didn't put that money aside, we wouldn't have money to pay for buses. Uh, the CalPERS UAL liability, that's $2 million for a bucket. So that will help pay for, like, if something happens and CalPERS has a negative return on our money, we'll have a big open gap. And CalPERS will require us to cover that gap for people's pensions. And this will help fund and pay for that. Uh, fuel tax credit, that's small. Uh, the matching, uh, where it says matching operating capital reserves of $4 million, that is for us to do all the other stuff outside of buses. So this is all the matching activities for outside of buses, as well as all the brake fixes that take place. Air conditioning breaks. Well, we got to pay for it, so that's going to pay for it, that amount of money. And then our reserve replenishments. So this <clears throat> reserve replenishments is just a function of um, how much we spend on our operating PL. So we have one bucket that says put aside three months for the operating costs. So if we our operating costs go up a little bit, the reserve will go up so we can cover three months. Uh, as well as we have a cash flow bucket that basically covers the ebbs and flows of payments that go in and out of this agency. We may not receive the money till later, but we got to put the money out, cover it, and so forth. So that adjusts. So that number will actually always go up unless we have a scale back and we reduce our costs. Then it would actually go the other direction. So we're taking $9.5 million and putting it aside. Remember, 6.8, 9.5, that puts us in a negative hole. So there's where it becomes the issue where we're taking money from our reserves, this is not on this list, our reserve bucket to cover that difference. This is our COVID reserve bucket. And then on our FY25 to 26, these are the changes that we made. Primarily, this, these changes haven't really changed much other than uh, the biggest thing here is our labor and fringe and our medical is $3.6 million in it. And like I said, some of the stuff that we put in, I showed that changed. Not much has changed from 25 to 26 um, since I last reported uh, Monday morning. <laughs> so ultimately, the changes right now from 25 to 26 puts us about $2.2 million worse, down to 3.5. And this is expected because our revenues don't grow as fast as our costs because we're primarily a cost-driven agency, you know, helping the, the public out. Uh, so now we're at 3.5, and 
And then this is kind of gives you an idea. Our passenger fares are just slightly off. Then our fully loaded wages are a big one, 3.6. And there's regular polls for people, step increases. And the big thing, the biggest driver of this, surprisingly, is benefits. 7.2% increase. And honestly, I, I think it's a little light. If that's what they're projecting, 7.2, we're seeing almost upwards of almost close to 12%. So uh, 3.6 million and then non-personnel costs. We're bringing down some of the consulting fees and so forth. Uh, this is the budget side by side. As you can see, the special transit fares, and this is base, this is not quite phase one, phase two, or um, zero fares. So the 388 is our natural increase in our passenger fares that we would have if we were staying going forward. So you're talking about a four hundred nine thousand uh, dollar increase. Our, of course, then of course our regular and our fringe on our labor side. You saw that that was the big piece, and a little bit of reduction in non-personnel. So we're about two million dollars lower on our operating surplus, or two million dollars worse off on our operating surplus year over year. And from there, uh, we have some offsets, and we have the grants that come in, and so on. And we're still maintaining that two million. So remember, we've talked about it's like it was six point eight, five point seven. Now this is the base. We have all those transfers, and we're going to have those transfers again. So as you can see, now we're at three point five. So we're eating away from that COVID reserve bucket. Um, so it's going to start going down. So as part of it, this is consolidated. This does include phase one, phase two and one year of zero fares. So there's your 6.8 going to 5 million. Biggest driver uh, up at the top is the fact that you kind of see the passenger fares all come back because you only have 10 months of zero fares in, in 25, and it drafts only two months. So you get 10 months of actual fares. And then you've got your cost, as, as, as you can see, really in 26, it really starts to kind of balloon on the regular and fringe because we have increased all these drivers. So as you add more drivers, those costs start to increase more and more because all of those drivers are going to have pay increases as well as benefits. And that all goes up. Down below, uh, we are using pretty much a, a lot of our TRSA grant as well as the state funding, state federal grants. And that gets us down to about $5 million. And then just our operating budget and risk. So, you know, as we kind of go through this, this is more um, stuff that you kind of know. But we're going to document it here. Our passenger fares, paratransit fares, fluctuation in ridership. Of course, if we go to zero fares, that's always an impact. If we have changes in any type of special contracts like UCSC or Rio or for that matter, the city of, of Santa Cruz. Sales tax, TDA, this is, we said we had no idea, but right now sales tax looks to kind of be more flat year over year. So that's a little concerning. You know, we're hoping that it kind of kicks back in if you start spending money, but I said that's uncertain. Uh, federal funding is subject to appropriations. You know, if they change Congress to from Democrat to Republican, that can make changes. Who knows? Uh, economic drawdown from recession, natural disasters, then of course fuel cost volatility. That's a big thing right now because we have no idea which way things are going. Their futures are showing a, a dramatic increase in CNG costs, but we don't know yet. Uh, workers' comp, medical insurance, contract renewals, settlement. We have our aging fleet, a lot of maintenance costs, and just getting parts are a problem. We have a lot of buses down that we're waiting on parts to come in because they're special order parts. Um, changes in unfunded mandates, overtime costs to the shortage of drivers. I don't think we'll have that in the near term. Uh, it, is, it could happen. And government mandates for employee leaves and so forth, if that changes. On the capital side, everybody good at this point from on the operating side? Can you comment? Um, I'm sorry, wait till you're done with the Okay. All right. So on the capital budget, the capital budget technically is $115.4 million. And in that, we're expected to spend 
uh, $71.9 million on these brand new hydrogen buses. Right now, the target date is FY25. Um, if they slip kind of the timeline as they go forward, you know, that they're not producing them as fast, that could fall into 26, but it still doesn't change the fact that it's 71.9. Um, and then we're added in a few uh, revenue, non-revenue vehicles, one fleet truck and two fleet cars. We need the fleet cars for the bus drivers to show themselves the bus stops, change drivers and so forth. And with all the drivers coming in, especially with phase two, we're at cars. Are we using like electric cars or you know, grain cars? The last cars we bought were the were electric cars, okay. which was the bolts, but it took us a long time to receive them. I think it's still we're looking at the identity of either a hybrid or uh full oh, electric car. Oh there you go. So we're just I, I think we need to move forward in that direction and not like buy gas vehicles. So yeah. Okay, good. On the construction related projects, uh currently right now is the biggest one I'm feeling thing is the fact that uh, the hydrogen fueling station, as well as the temporary hydrogen fueling um, refueler. Now, we're not sure if we're going to go down the lease or the buy route yet, but the point is it's about four and a half million, and then of course the hydrogen tank, that's the big. So uh, the other thing, uh, bus rapid hand enhancements on SoCal Drive, that's kind of split over 25 and 26 for about nine and a half. And that's covered by Tursa. By the way, the hydrogen piece, the Tursa piece, uh, for the most part, it's, it's Tursa. Um, and then the bus wrap and enhancements, again, for the most part, it's Tursa. Watsonville parking lot, in case we have to do stuff down there, because we have a lot of things to do. Uh, and then the Watsonville station redevelopment of the 8.5 On the next page, uh, maintenance facility upgrade for the hydrogen buses, 35 bus shelters, and, with, and some with but, uh, new trash cans, automated security gates, and so forth. That's about another 2.4 and 25, and then about 100 next year. And by the way, all these are covered in some way, shape, or form by either our money or some grant. We're not putting anything that's in there that this is what we'd like to have, but it's not covered. Uh, then on the fleet maintenance and equipment, we have training aids. This is basically the simulator. They're putting in a bus simulator across the street, or at least preliminarily it's going to go there. We still don't get it. Um, that's for 555. And then there's a high pressure water system that's going to go in the bus wash for underneath the bus because it needs to be replaced. And so that's 200,000. IT, we have the ERP project coming to an end, as well as our finalizing our new website design. Hopefully that will be fun. And then last, other miscellaneous, this is this is the only piece that's not really programmed to any capital project. This is part of the money we put aside to do these small things like brake fixes and so forth of that nature. So this money's sitting there. So if an air conditioning unit breaks, then we'll just pull it out of that 202 and then replace it with air conditioning. So, but it's not programmed to a specific project. And how it's broken down into the 115, the biggest thing our turn step covers about a third of our funding for all of this project. The VW grant, it's just, this is the $480,000 per bus um, rebate that we'll, we'll be receiving to receive these hydrogen buses. That's another 22%. The federal grant from the FTA is another 21%. And the last piece, which is critical, is really the major D in the operating capital reserve fund. That's about 21%. That's our own money. So we're taking our money and putting it into this, the bond to do all the rest of this. So 22% of the 115 is our money. And then lastly, some additional information. I'm not going to go through all of it, um, through all of this, but uh, like I said, these are just activities we put in every year for the board. So these are like special days and events. Um, another, again, here's some employee appreciation, appreciation activities, exactly what's taking place. We have memberships that are baked into our budget and the details that will be posted, you know, on the website. Everything from APTA, you know, Cadillac, CTA even smaller memberships, and this is for um, each of the different groups as we go through. Total of 108 going to 111, that's just the natural increase each of these agencies bring in. 
And then the big thing here is uh, we're going to keep this in. This is basically APTA as well as the CTA, possibly bring a board member here to at least the uh, uh, APTA meeting that's in BC. I think we did it in the past. I think it all got completely shut down, especially over COVID. And I think at this point, we're going to look to see this happen. And then last our employee incentive program. So these are welcome kits, employee appreciation events, some of the awards, and then of course plus the plus rate. And that's relatively flat. Where we stand today is in May. And then of course June and 30 plus days, we're going to come back and finalize the budget and close the public comment period and uh, hopefully approve the budget and move forward. I think that's it. I will show you the cash projected deficit based off everything we have showed it in the uh, committee meeting. So right here, base projected cash deficit uh, for the budget. So this is base case, no phases, no, no zero fares. So right now we're expected to pull money out of that COVID bucket so it all runs out um, somewhere in spring of 2027 at this point right now. And then if we go in where we're making, um, we want to put in, Zero, uh, zero fares, as well as do phase one and phase two, but conclude phase two in summer of 2027, completely stop it. And this is assuming that we don't get a sales tax. We're talking about winter of 2027 is when we, we say, you know, that's where we kind of run out of cash. However, if we go in and we do assume we do get the sales tax, you know, and we keep phase one and phase two in continuation, didn't touch zero fares. That's still the one year pilot program. Phase one, phase two. Now we're talking about spring of 30, 2034. Well, and I feel like it's going to be farther than that because we're really putting in numbers or guessing um, at that point. That far. But that gets us at least a decade or more out in the future before we have to worry about doing. That's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody can wake up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have some questions to start with Director Dietrich. Thank you. Wow, I'm exhausted. Um, I can only imagine how you feel. That was a good report. I actually have many three or four questions. My, one of my first questions is, um, have you worked with like VCE at all in regarding to like energy infrastructure? Mm -hmm. They have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, beneficial, Grant money or with any of our with any of our infrastructure or uh, I know Michael was sorry. working with 3CE. Um, I haven't personally, no, but I know Michael's been. Yeah, I. Oh, sorry. Yes, we are. Oh, okay, because I think it's we because I know us at the city they've been very helpful. We've got an electric um, dump truck, and I mean there's there's things that they can help us out with that um, with this. So I think it's really important to cultivate that relationship. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good one. Yeah, we both sit on the board, so yeah. <laughs> We're actually three of us now, right? So, uh, but yeah, so definitely, I would start to work with that relationship so we can have, especially since we're going to be having, you know, our, our, I don't know what you call the cars go back and forth, the commuter cars, and there's other, we're not just using buses. We have other vehicles that we use that um, uh, tra transportation. Vehicles. Huh? Yeah, it's either uh, revenue or non-revenue. Non-revenue buses. Oh, okay. no, non-revenue transportation vehicles. Yeah, yeah. those are usually cars. Cars, yeah. yeah. Or but also trucks too, though. You know, or like you know the yeah. the, the, the trucks that we use to. Well, so I still need the so they, uh, trucks, so yeah. workers. I think of anything yeah. that's not a bus. Yeah. So, um, and then um, you brought up the Watson Station. Is all the funding there for it, or are we still working to get funding? From our side of the house, mm -hmm. yes, but from the housing side, I don't know. I don't know where it stands. It kind of went quiet. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, I just saw something yesterday that came in. Because they're asking for some information. So I think they're going through kind of making sure everything's okay and so on. So somebody's working on that. Just Who's the uh, point person for Metro on that project? I don't know. So we met yesterday uh, with. City of Watsonville and Mid Penn. Mid Penn is the oh, okay. affordable housing developer. Mm -hmm. So, like Chuck said, from our standpoint, for the metro side of it, 
we got the turf set, we got read. Uh, our, our funding is set, and it's on the developer to secure the rest of the funding. So there'll be other state grants, like state affordable housing, say the communities grant, or they're, they're looking at another infrastructure grant, um, and then whatever finance they put together. So that's going to be interesting to see, and I guess it's a conversation I can have with the city, because I know as a council, um, I, I think that we've been educated on the fact that where you receive your funding is who goes into that housing. And so a lot of times, a lot of the new projects that have gone into Watsonville have taken funding from, uh, let's say, uh, the Housing Authority, right? And that list is pulled from San Benito and San Cruz counties. So it isn't just because you live, I think some people thought that, oh, we're building a Watsonville, so only Watsonville people are going to be living in, in this housing. And that's not the case. I mean, it's, it's pulled from lists that have two counties. So I think that it's going to be interesting to see how the city's going to move forward, knowing where I know that the council really wants to house people that reside in Watsonville. Um, and so, yeah. So the plan is still 100% affordable. I didn't see any uh, county specific sources on their list. There was okay. just state and the funding that we provided. And, but it's, it's well, really true. early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do you mean really early? So in terms of the financing that the kind of putting together. Uh, okay. So what do you expect as a timeline? Uh, within the next, well, they're going to, they're, they're trying to apply for a state grant in October. Um, so that'll kind of dictate a lot of the remaining funding that they'll need okay. to raise. Okay. Um, they just had the first conversation with city yesterday. Okay. I'll talk to Susie about it. Yeah, so we met okay. Susie yesterday for the first time on okay. the project. Great, thank you. Yes. And then uh, my third question is um, the sales tax. When do, you, if you do go out or we go out to a sales tax, is it 2024 or 2026? That you well, right now the way it's projected here is 2026. 2026. November 2026. And then as part of it, we get a little bit in 2026 and then it starts to kick in at 2027 and all that. Okay, and then if that doesn't kick in, then then you ultimately. I understand it's not a good. Then you're going to go back. Yeah, it's not a good picture. I mean, you know, we're going to have to know sooner or later because we're going to have to make decisions. We'll have a contingency plan too. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but assuming that phase one, phase two, or go less, is we could not afford that. Right. I mean, I don't want to be like a Debbie Downer, but like if it doesn't go through, then. I mean, are we looking at you no know, colas? Like, we're, are we yeah, really it's a kind of, the kind of, It's a really bad, bad situation. Yes, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, I hate to say it's sure, but it's it's going to be tough. It's, it's, it's going to be real tough. Those are the days we want to go back to. So, um, when I first got here a million years ago with Mike, I think we got on the same time. Um, well, he's probably on way before me, but this last this last go round, um, there were the reserves were. There were none, right? So I think that there was a lot of uh, pain that went through to like try to build the reserves back up. And so it's be hard to see it go back there. Yeah. And then I guess my last one's kind of a fun one. When's the um, when's the rodeo, the bus rodeo? <laughs> um, should we have a plan yet? I don't know if it's we, don't have a, we don't have a date yet. No date? Oh, okay. But I'll, I'll get you one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, talking with the zero fares and all, in general, it is, um, this, the fare and revenue accounts for about, what, 20% of our general fund, less than that, at 18. And, well, it depends, but you start putting in the contracts, it's probably more like actual people paying, not like UC Santa Cruz or Cabrillo. Um, it's about 7 maybe 8%. Well, we can without Cabrillo, yeah. And then... Uh, that was a lot of information. And um, what is your biggest concern? Sales tax plan and the fuel cost volatility. So right now today is is fuel cost because I, I mean I don't know where it's going to go. And then the sales tax piece is a more concerning for the fact that we're probably going to hit budget, maybe be a little bit better than budget. You know, this year in twenty four. My concern is this latter half, or at least I'll just say. January and February, because we're two months behind when we actually receive the sales tax, um, is underneath our budget. And if it continues, what I worry about is it's spreading. Can we jump into next year already with the spread if we're being flat year over year? We're already going to go in, uh, in the hole. 
And then I could make a suggestion about, might offer that uh, we could have the executive director, Rob Shaw, of 3CE come and just present a general 10 minute overview of what we're doing and how it applies to, to this district, of course, but it's, we're into ag, we're into bikes, we're into uh, electric uh, bikes, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, I think that'd be an interesting thing. Uh, you might entertain that, but I'd be glad to ask. Yeah, that'd be great. I think, uh, Director Rocky, do you have a question? Yeah, so I think the comment the budget financing audit committee recommends this budget to the board for a passage that, uh, uh, last Friday. Should know that. Yeah. Uh, and my second question is what, if anything, can you tell us about the impacts of the governor's uh, uh, deductions in the state budget on our own? That's my question, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, right now, I mean, at least the way I'm reading it, and then of course, I think others could pipe into as well. I feel like we're good right now. Um, it doesn't look like we've been really impacted, at least right now on anything so we still have the terse up if anything that i feel like we have a problem and i gotta i don't have the answer to this this is one day i've been kind of noodling is that they're kind of spreading out of when we can do the drawdowns of, of the funding from it used to be two years now it's three years now it's like a third a third a third and how does that impact because a lot of the money that's going to some of the projects here and so forth i think the money from, but this is not cycle six. This is the newest one. It's fine because we're actually built, uh, we're drawing it down over time, meaning that you know, like phase one, phase two. You see, it's kind of spread. So I think we're okay there. What I'm more worried about is if it is cycle six, if they do something there and they spread that money, we have a lot of money. It's like all those buses at once. That seventy-two million dollars that's sitting there. Um, I don't know if we can draw down all that if it's we're only getting a third. And if we can't draw it down, do we just put it on hold and draw it down later on? Is that possible? And then we float the cash, which we don't have, which means then I'm going to have to go out and get a short term loan in order to float the cash in order for that money to come in so we pay off the loan, the bridging. So there's a lot of dynamics in play, but I think it's it was June 15th, I think, is when the final, final. As soon as that June 15th hits, then I feel like relief, you know, that everything will be better. But right now, the way it's written, everything in there, it looks good for us. I mean, I keep reading the paper, I don't see the word transit, the list of things that are whack, whack his way at. So they left it in. And, and I think, you know, John told me right, it's the fact that. I guess the last budget cycle, Newsom wanted to cut transit, but when it back, went back to the legislator, uh, legislative area, they, they put it back in. That was last year. This year, he didn't cut it. So I feel like we got a leg up going in there because they're not going to touch us. But then again, it's a big gap. So yes. anything's in play between now and June 15th. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just touch on that really quickly and then I'll come back to our Q Director Taylor. There was um, 1.3 billion in proposed funding shifts for transit overall, but the fact that they maintained all of the formula TERSIP and 96% of the competitive TERSIP, I think we were really um, fortunate that that was the outcome of the, of the May revise. I'm so sorry, I was, I was following that, so I was excited to hear the question because I feel like that was really important um, to consider the impacts that the state budget in the May revise would have on this. Um, Can I add a piece to that? So uh, my second day, I got a call from Mike Pimentel telling me about this news. That's our longest. I think he knew about it and just waited until I got here. <laughs> when you say the, uh, uh, So the, the thing of, that we're seeing is, is they're not lowering the transit uh, overall amount, but they're shifting where the funding's comes from. And that's that's the, the big concern. Is it was all from the general fund before, but now they're shifting some of this transit funding uh, to come from this really unfunded uh, bucket of uh, zero emission uh, funding. I don't, I can't remember the, the acronym for it, but anyway, so some of that's being shifted, so that's a concern. Um, so that's why we've been reaching out, we met with uh, with our legislators, uh, with their staff this week, uh, really try to advocate for this funding and trying to help them understand the impact that it will have. And I think we're one of the few agencies that is 
really out ahead. We have a, a true plan for this funding and what we'll do with it, and it will have a huge impact on us. So I appreciate how cloudy the crystal ball is about fuel costs, mm -hmm. but how about the shift from CNG and diesel to mm -hmm. hydrogen? What do we have any guidelines? Do we have any confidence about hydrogen costs once we're shifting to that fuel source? I mean, at this point right now, hydrogen fuel costs are still high. Very high. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is is the fact that. Hydrogen buses get one and a half to two times better gas mileage, if you want to put it that way. So, um, but it is higher than our CNG. And it'll probably, when we transfer from CNG to hydrogen, it's still going to be higher. So there is going to be a cost impact, which is not layered in here of that increase. Um, but, you know, there is this promise that they're building and they're going to start producing it. And they're going to get it down to like $3 a gallon. It's, so we're relying. I'm following the same promise and thinking about the timeline of that process as to when our buses are here and need to be fueled. So just keep me mindful of that. Also following arches and the rest of our partnerships across the state. Thank you. Yes, uh, Director Cummings. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask just to repeat what you said. It's basically this line and the other uh, graph. Or basically assuming the same fuel mix that we have today. Yes. Okay. Well, fuel mix, but for the hydrogen piece, we're assuming that there's going to be a little bit of an uptake. So there is actually some hydrogen that's built in here at a higher, higher increase, but it continues. We know that when hydrogen body comes in, it's going to be actually probably even higher, and then it's going to come down. Um, I can't predict what it is. I mean, people are saying by 2030, it should be like $3, you know, that, that type of stuff. But now it's trading at thirteen dollars, so it's one of those situations where I'm guessing. So if I just smooth it out, being that it's in the future, you get the idea of the graph of which direction it's kind of going. So you are assuming that hydrogen will come down a little bit, or in projection? No, I'm assuming, assuming that hydrogen. Our, our uptick is as we convert from CNG to hydrogen. There's a little bit of an uptick, and then CNG goes away, and the hydrogen's here, and then it, the hydrogen just. Grows just like CNG. Okay. I I don't know the beep or the down side, but assuming it stays that same kind of trend line, right? And if we get lucky, could come down. But yeah. I mean, I agree. It's better not to plan for yeah. something like that. Um, all right, you advance this slide a couple to the uh, exciting graph. This is the uh, <laughs> China <laughs> graph. Uh, this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so one thing I think you mentioned, just want to confirm, is that this assumes we do not continue free fare, zero fares, correct? Uh, even after, even if we pass about that's correct. Okay. I mean, I think, uh, but a couple things on zero fares. First is I think that probably this meeting we should push it out of here at least, right? I mean, at the very least, we should run it up to pass the about measure rather than throw it out there for a year and then walk away from it. I mean, the other question is, do we want to do it at all? I mean, is it going to be seen as false advertising to the public? I mean, if we could include it in the ballot measure and say, hey, pass this, we'll keep up, spend service and zero fares, great. But if not, if it's going away no matter what in whatever, a year after we started, is it worth doing it, right? Maybe we should start thinking harder about, okay, are we going to get a clipper card here? Right? How are we going to modernize our... Uh, fee system rather than, you know, have this funny that, uh, you know, ends. Um, so that's one piece. Um, and then, of course, it starts to be some pretty significant year over year uh, shortfalls, right? I mean, it starts at like a couple million and it gets up to, to 10 million. Uh, and of course, this is like assuming best case scenario where we actually pass the sales tax rate measure, which uh, it's not going to be easy either, right? I mean, we just saw. Countywide sales tax passed at fifty five percent. That was for all the things people care about the most. Whenever we survey them, which is local roads, homelessness, and housing, right? And now we're talking about something that yeah, people care about the environment, people care about transit, but are we going to do? I mean, we might need to seriously consider engaging some kind of citizen group to take a kind of similar route to uh, the, the land trust measure that's coming up this fall, trying to get that down to fifty percent for the whole step. 
And then, I mean, that, you know, that fun, uh, exciting giant dipper ride down, uh, about 2030, uh, I mean, tells me we better start seriously talking about other funding sources, uh, both this agency and at the RTC. I mean, the only two I can come up with are current funding districts, allowing increased development in certain areas, where now would increase property taxes are paying towards transit, or port and price, congestion pricing, like New York's down with their lower uh, financial district, where you come in, you pay a congestion price during a single uh, occupant vehicle, that goes towards funding transit. I mean, <laughs> got, got other ideas, uh, we'll hear them, but we need to start studying this stuff pretty soon in order to then actually be in the position to stand up these systems and hopefully start collecting revenue by you know, the end of the uh, decade. All that with other sources. Yes, Director uh, Miss so, so maybe following on that a little bit, first of all, this is a great presentation and it's a lot of information that was laid out really clearly. It was a lot of transparency for the board and the public. So just want to recognize and appreciate that. To, to follow Director Koenig's uh, points, um, the trends aren't very good in terms of the long-term financial viability. And obviously a, sales, a successful sales tax measure buys a good bit of time, but still, so still this downward trend. Um, I wasn't here when when this board decided to advance uh, free fares, zero fares. Um, I think it was ostensibly, at least in part, to reduce uh, dwell times. There are, there are other ways to do that, such as with auto warning. Um, but, you know, given this given this path and the timing vis-a-vis -vis the election, it seems like it might be something the board may want to reconsider. Notice that next year with free fares, you'd be losing nearly $3 million in revenue. And the shortfall after transfers is about three, a little more than $3 million. So it's just kind of willfully creating that deficit, which accelerates the decline in available cash. I'm not sure if that if that makes if that makes sense to do. Um, and I'll just note that it has the impact. Uh, well, fares are a small part, as you pointed out, of the overall revenues. Um, currently, I think the special fares are about 66 percent of the total fares in the base budget for next year, that would jump up to 73 as of the new fare. If you add in the zero fare, it jumps up to something like 90% special fares are covering fare budget. So that there are just their impacts to the three fare program, that zero fare program that they want to consider, even if there's a sales tax. Just something that I think the board should Center to direct the phone next one as well. Um, I, I did have, I guess, just two questions. Uh, one was that the sale does, does the sales tax projection, not the sales tax, but the, the current sales tax, does the projection come from the county? It was surprising to me, and I heard you say that the first two months are already down, which is surprising, but that even in the next fiscal year, that you expect that to be flat, which is I think nearly a million dollars off of the original. Is that data that comes from the county, or is it the, the, the county projection? So, so the county gives us the number. The, the number becomes our uh, how much money we receive each month. It's two months and two months lag. So February we get that in April, and we'd actually put that as April money, but even though it's February. So when you start looking back and you look at COVID, pre COVID, COVID, and then coming out of COVID, you know things really took off, and you could definitely see how much it was going up, you know, based off of what time of the year and so forth, and our budget, and then we planned our budget based off of what we knew when it would grow year over year, and we put it in, and usually it's been beating that our budget. It's been doing wonderfully. It's been going up, it's staying up, it's staying higher, and now it's starting to drop. So when you look at you know sales tax per day for each of the different months, 
it's going down and or flat. And I'm really concerned. I'm hoping we have this great weather here and people come over here and spend their money and, and everything of that nature. But like I said, I don't know if that's going to help it or not. I know that part and parcel that, you know, people come in here, if they're buying houses, they're going and buying food, buying everything else, it's great. I, I don't know because the county doesn't give me information to that level of detail of like what's changed, what's lower, what, is it because people are not buying houses, they're not coming out there buying food, so you still have the same people who have a house that has their second home and they're not here, and they're just not coming. I mean, I, I, I don't know. But just off of the trends of what we're seeing and how it's kind of coming down, it is trending flat, the slightly like down. But to answer your question, the county starts with the state estimates and then makes adjustments based on what they think is going to happen here. They're the ones that come up with that number. I'm just, I, I would think with all the strength of the economy coming out of COVID, with all the building that's happening in the city and to some extent the county, that it would be up. I guess better to project and be conservative. Hopefully, hopefully you're undershooting. Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on that. It. And then just on the the on the fuel issue, um, unless the arches can really make progress, it's it's natural gas that's used to create the hydrogen. So that that curve showed the hydrogen the CNG futures is probably more or less going to track. Hydrogen is going to look like in the future as well, unless the technology really changes, which doesn't doesn't seem likely. So, even with the switch, the, the hydrogen, it's it's great to have optimistic future forecast. But I think also here, it's good that you're being conservative and assuming that it's not going to be cheaper. It's good, right? You they did fund it. Yeah. That doesn't exist yet. Thank you. Uh, Director's chair. Uplifting conversation. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, Manu has a point. I, mean, I think that this was a good conversation that we're having. And I, so when does the um, we anticipate the free rides at the August of next year. So okay, so one per year, and that's gonna that's gonna be a, a cost of four point seven. Four point seven. Okay, and then if we renewed it, it's another. Could be a point zero five. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. I think we need to really reconsider that. I mean, some people may not think that's a lot, but that's that's a lot, and um, especially with what we're faced with, and um, I know that a lot of people may seem positive about um, a, a sales tax like this passing, but I have to agree with Manu. You know, what they were talking about in their sales tax, people really, they drive the roads every single day, their cars feel it, um, even though people may support it. And the idea of the bus system, I don't know if that's going to get to third. So I don't know. I think we need to, as a board, really reconsider the, um, continuing that. I don't know how everyone else feels, but I mean, that's a lot of money if you say. Dr. Yeah, initially the, the zero fares wasn't, in fact, wasn't that partly because of all the changes in the routes to be able to help um, people adjust to the change to zero fares. And I know we received some recognition, some possibly grant help because of that program, right? So we received funding we wouldn't have. Had we not? That's the point I was just making. Okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry. No, I was at, I was hoping you were waiting point. for that to come in. So, yeah, so we've secured two, almost two and a half million from LCTOP, low carbon transit operating funds. Right. Uh, half of that for youth zero fare program, and the other half for zero fare general. And we've also built into this one time TERSEP operating funds yeah. a zero fare portion for a year. year yeah. Time, right. So the funding is already there for at least a year, and we can rely on, I think, 1.2 million for the LCTOP program, at least for the second year, I would imagine. And I mean, this, consider yeah. depending on what happens. Yeah, I mean, I understand that this conversation makes a whole lot of sense given you know the charts that we're looking at. There's a lot of reasons I think that we should keep the discussion on the table of zero fare. We're we're putting in a massive service increase, right? 50%. 
uh, one of the biggest barriers to people just getting off for the first time is how do we figure out how to, how to work, right? And we want to really encourage people during these first year or two years to try out this new system um, that we're putting in with this one-time uh, terms of funding. Uh, it does help reduce operation costs both on the street and cost of cash, cost of cash collection and just equity. You know, we're we're sixty five percent of our riders make twenty four thousand dollars or less, and that's excluding UCSC. That's based on our twenty nineteen last last onboard survey. And so there's a huge equity component of this, and it's it's not a large percentage of our overall budget. And ridership numbers too, right? And ridership, right? Which I thought increased. Yes, they have reduced. 23%. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. The first phase of reimbursement. COVID. We're currently sitting at about 81% pre COVID. Right. Um, year over year, the first phase of reimbursement Metro, 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 which didn't put in a lot of service increase, that first phase that we did, it rejiggered the network, which usually you'd expect ridership to decrease because you're changing people's routes, you're changing people's habits. It takes time to adjust. Ridership went up 23%. We're still, still down 20% from COVID. Still down about 19% pre COVID. Good. So we've been recovering about 15% each year. Okay. Coming so out of COVID. There, then. And this one, just, just based, we only have one quarter of data so far. Mm -hmm. But the first quarter of service change, it jumped from what we were seeing about 15% year over year to 23%. And that's without this 20% uh, increase we're doing in September, another 20% increase we're doing in, sorry, 20% in June, 20% in September, the full phase two rollout. Uh, so we should see that number come up quite a bit. And, and as you're saying, I mean, a really good point is that it is a zero fare that that allowed us to get the funding. That's what we have for, yeah, for the two uh, LC top cycles, we applied for zero fare, we received that funding, and we carved out at least one year in this SB 125 terms of funding to fund the program. Um, I think beyond the first year, it gets it gets trickier, but there, I think there's at least 1.2 million that we can count on from LC top again. And that's what we're talking about. We've been looking second year. Make that decision. Uh, uh, Director Johnson, and okay. I have a question as well. Did I see another hand over you? Oh, okay. So we'll do uh, Director Calentari Johnson and Director Downing, and then I have a question as well. Yeah. Uh, John really kind of hit it just that the zero fare, um, it was in the context of a, a bigger vision and to contribute towards that. Um, our, one of our goals, which is increase, doubling ridership within five years. Is that right? That was the goal. Um, so, and I think you've really touched on it, but the other thing I wanted to say is um, maybe we need to consider our sales tax uh, measure timing. Uh, maybe we need to consider the timing for it to be sooner, and maybe we need to consider um, revisiting the polling. If, if a lot has shifted in terms of the economics of our community and the political will of the community, um, I think we should consider Repolling and then seeing if we want to go sooner. Director Downey? Uh, that's what I was going to talk about was the, the, we did some preliminary polling, isn't that correct? That was positive. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that would be a really good idea to try that again, just to make sure we're still on track, especially before we decide if we want to change uh, when to do that ballot measure. Thanks. I suggest waiting for the polling till <laughs> September or later. So with the second phase, I'm going to put my optimistic bet on this. With the second phase, phase two, we'll have brought a 15 minute or better service within a half mile of 100,000 Santa Cruz residents. That's never been the case in this county. We're hoping everyone jumps on the bus. We don't know if that will happen, but the service will be there and it will be accessible really for the first time. We've had a, a large, you know, an extensive network in the past, but never the frequency. Uh, so that's, that's just my optimistic bet that bringing it to at least half half the number of residents in the county will encourage people to, to get on the system and potentially support the taxes. You might not be competing against other local majors that would be coming up in the next year too. Also, yeah, um, I think that was the thinking. That's all that that we would show some outcomes yeah. before we ask the community to invest. Mm -hmm. Like, look what we can do, help us continue this. Yeah. Um, what did you say, Dr. Lynn? Well, about? also about the campaign measures. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that while I was in the next year. Director Ashley? Oh, I mean, I think we do okay every 
Not very much time to get him. I thought was we could do it. Other, yeah. Two of that, I would. This idea about the possibility of working with certain with that, and certainly do that in a way that puts us in it along with them and stuff, but meets the legal requirement to have it. 50% vote. That's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I kind of agree. I think that the board has to, a supervisor has to put something on the ballot by, we have to make that decision in August so we wouldn't have any polling data after, you know, increasing service. So I don't, I don't know how we make it this year. And I, I agree, let's work, let's do this, let's do it smarter, not harder. Um, and, you know, rather than kind of quite possibly having to push ourselves through two election cycles if we then failed in the fall and then had been all over again. Um, you know, I think it's fun work just more strategizing. Um, I was going to ask uh, Director Ergo. So, I mean, okay, you kind of shift, you might think about the three fairs from this is, you know, the uh, future of our system and, and marketing for the ballot measure to more like uh, marketing uh, for an improved service. So, I mean, if you had, do uh, you used to do sort of, uh, you can put this one year free fare anywhere. Where do you think they, with the launch of the service, I would do it. But I, I totally see your point, and I kind of agree with you that we would want to try everything we can to extend it up to the point that we're doing a ballot measure or a little bit beyond. And the point really I just wanted to make is that we have it funded 100% for the first year. Second year it gets trickier. But I, my math thinks we have at least maybe 50% funded for the second year between the LC top funding that we've secured already. And I think the future here that we can run on count. Right. I mean, is the LC top funding dependent on us some like basically matching to or like delivering a full year of free errors? Uh we just have to expend the allocation on we have up to three years actually. But so we can expend it in 10 months, we can expend it in a year, we can expend it as three years. If we, uh, I mean, we've done three years for like a month, so we'll launch phase one, right? I mean, if we look at it that way, maybe rather than doing a continuous year, we say, let's do three months of free fair, and we may roll out phase two, and then let's say, we'll see how it goes, and then post will have free fair in about two, summary, and we'll run up to the right page. Uh, yeah, one of the sources, no, because it funds you free free, and that's just not feeling that we request reimbursement for the use free free. The second funding, the application we put in was for 10 months, but we could go back to the state to change that for a shorter time period. Uh, but what we put in was to to support free fares for this 10 month period starting in September. But that one, I mean, it's, it's we just have, to, we have a, you know, a certain timeline to expand the funds that I think it could be pushed. That's kind of similar to what my question was going to be. I have uh, great concerns to your point about the equity issue and for and forgetting about zero fare altogether. Um, but my question or thought was going to be if we needed to push it back to 25, 26, so that year runs up to a ballot measure rather than doing it now. But it sounds like that's not recommended based on the desire to roll it out with the service changes. That it's not a funding issue. We can do that with the funding, so we have three years. But if we want to roll out free fares with the service changes, it needs to be done in twenty four twenty five and not twenty five twenty six. Is that correct? The fi yeah, the final phase, the final phase of phase two, we're putting in in September. So if we want to time the free fare period beginning then, then that's what we want to do it. But we could totally reconsider that schedule and that plan, uh, and maybe shift it to a later year. And that that would be possible with with any LC top funding. Um, but we also have, I mean, the first year we got fully funded because this one time terms of <clears throat> money that we received is two hundred twenty-five funding. We took a portion of that for the zero fare program. So based on what we know right now today, what is this, what changes in this graph if we extend it for another year? Like how, when does that, I guess we'll, we'll continue well, to size. differ. When does that go up and then back down? 
comparatively to well, right now we're at three six. If we extend it one more year, one more fiscal year, if John said it's about what two million? Yeah, I'll see that. Yeah. One one point two. One point two. So your three six that you see right there will probably drop down closer to zero, but then it'll spike back up. So it won't put us in the red. Yeah, it'll just shift three. that curve downward a little bit more, but it won't put us in the red. I just think that, um, you know, given these free fares, and then if we yank it right before an election, these people will That wouldn't be smart. Yeah. yeah. So I think that would really tank a measure. So we have to, I think we're going to be at zero, about 3.6. If we, I think we're going to be forced to do that here. That's just my view. I think that's what he was just. Yes. What he was that that, that yeah, was what he was just saying was in response to my question is that three point six would be closer to zero if we added another year right. to it, but it wouldn't be zero. Right. It won't be zero, but if we have to extend it a couple more months, we could get by the next few months for the actual uh, election. You know, to say yay or nay, and if they say yes, then we'll bridge that gap between then and when we start receiving. Next time, as you're kind of close. I mean, so it's it's so I think Director Ruskin had his hand up and then we'll go to the Director Paper. Yeah, I just wanted to make that since there were discussions about equity, just I feel like it's important to note that we'd be going from relying on the special affairs, which are predominantly UC Santa Cruz students, from 66% to 90% of the fares that we collect. You see Santa Cruz students pay uh, for the Metro service something, I think, on the order of $200 a year. So 500 something dollar fee, more than a third of it funds the, the contract for Metro. It's, each order. So it's uh, 200 per quarter, it's four times three. So. Okay, five, so it's, I guess my point is that you see Santa Cruz students, and I, I, even more so for, for Rio, are predominantly from low income families. So something like 60% of our students pay zero tuition because they, they don't have income um, that requires them to. So just want to remind folks that we're going to say that the general public um, is paying zero, whereas our students who are predominantly low income uh, are going to be paying, are going to continue to pay, and, and that amount will be increasing. So as we think of equity, we need to think about it for all of the ridership, and the students are the majority of the ridership, more than 60%. Sorry. So, well, I'm new here. Uh, <laughs> and I, so my question, or I guess my comment is, uh, for whatever reason, we're calling uh, it special fares, but in reality, what we're offering is we're offering additional service. So it shouldn't really be categorized as special fares, it should be categorized as the university is paying for additional service to be provided. There. So there is a there is a, a a when you look at the the level of service provided throughout the county, there is a really high level of service already provided to the university. So that additional funding really helps pay for that. It really is not about the fares itself. Dr. So just because we're reopening this can, um, one possibility is zero fares is one, is there a possibility of reduced fares from what we're charging today? Sure, I mean, I think um, the downside of that is we still have to maintain all of the cost of cash collection, uh, security, et cetera, if that collects or reduced. Thanks. And the change for zero fares, you explained the budget meaning that we're using zero fares rather than free fares, and part of that, there was an optics of that term, the change of term? I think the optics came from our new CEO. When you say free fares, free could be a lot. But if you say zero fares, then you know you're getting the fare for zero. It's just that fair. It's truly free. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound better. <laughs> Zero marks, but not a free one. <laughs> 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 that's what that sounds like. Thank you. Any further uh, questions or comments from directors? 
All right, uh, I have a, a quick question before I take it out to public comment. So, um, Director Koenig, um, you suggested that we make a decision at this board meeting about whether or not, but I don't, I don't think that's yeah. possible today, right? No, because it's not going to agendize it for future. So that's part of my question: is if we approve the budget today and we agendize that for future, and it potentially changes the budget, will we just bring it back for a budget modification, or how would that? Yeah, my question is: if we're going to this is actually going to go out to the public so they comment and come back. At the next board meeting, if I'm, that's what we're going to say. We're going to approve this budget, but if we change in the middle of that, it's going to create some, I think, maybe some problems. Um, I don't know how, how we can address that. Well, you can always bring an amended budget back, uh, but for the annual budget process, you need to hold your public hearing and adopt the budget. Um, you and you amend your budget throughout the year, right? When you have big changes, so it would be part of that. And if you wanted, you could do another public hearing process, since it, you know, the well, and it's a fair change too, potentially. So you probably want to get public involvement, you know, in that process, you know, because you're going to be changing fares. Mm -hmm. Right, under your under your policy, but yeah, yeah. Um, we have additional direction to include, I don't know exactly what that that be considered when we come back next month. You mean, could you consider? You can say we approve this budget with the additional direction to look at the impact of that whatever we decide might have on the total budget we can discuss it next month. So that next month you have options, more options to consider, and then that would be part of the public process. So you have to prepare those options. But then we got to go through another 30 day process. If we not, if we don't go with this, do we need to go through another 30 day? Well, I think if you have your options spelled out during this 30 day period, you're allowing people to comment on those various options. I have to give it a little bit of thought. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, yeah there's, no, there's nothing for people to look at to give opinions on. And this way I don't want to get. No, you have to prepare those options mm -hmm. so that the public is able to comment on, you know, option A. Which we should have option B. What they would be right now and now, you know. So it sounds like the best opportunity for moving forward would be to um, do the recommended approval of the budget as it stands today and uh, the resolution setting a public hearing for June 28th and then have a future agenda item to consider what a future budget modification might be should we decide to move forward with an additional year of rate fares um, or get rid of free fares altogether. You know, yeah, that, that was an option. Too. I was thinking no fare, no free fares or free fares that'll get us through the ballot. So that would be a, a new agenda item at a, a future date that would tell us what our even future out the net uh, budget modification would need to be. Okay. Yeah, I think we should. Get that ball rolling. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so let's, uh, I don't think I need to, do I need to ask for a motion or anything just to ask for a future agenda item? I could just say, please no, bring that back to us in June. Yeah, right? you, you decide what's yeah. the future agenda. Yeah, if we could have that in June, um, that kind that kind of um, two options and, and what they might look like for a future budget modification, I think that it should probably be um, and I welcome feedback on this, a separate item from the actual public hearing for the budget. So as not to confuse people, I think we should have the budget public hearing and then a separate item on now that you've approved the budget, should you decide to move forward with these other things, here's how the budget will change. Um, if we could do that in June, I think that would be great. Yes, sir. There you go. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was just going to suggest a third option, which would be uh, and breaking up the year of free fairness and I was like pushing around lots of phase two and then another portion in the run up to the ballot measure. Yeah. And uh, 
That way we don't end up you know, paying for a whole other year on a difficult slim budget, um, but we still get that benefit of marketing before a ballot measure. Not to mention uh, later on, highway will be done so the you on Philadelphia Drive will be done, so actually the whole system should be formed a lot better. I guess the big thing about that is depending on how much time you want to do with the launch and how much time do you need the leeway. If that ends up being a year, you're going to be pretty much in the ballpark of what I show. It's just the timing between years. So it's not much there. So, um, I mean, I could do something if you well, well, I mean, it's actually, I think, a more question for Director Ergel, which is like, is that going to work for the LC top funding and state funding? Just making sure that. Yeah, I think it could. I think we could just break up, essentially take the year that we have funded or the 10 months, but let's call it a year, and break it up into, say, two six-month periods, and that wouldn't have any, shouldn't have any impact on the budget. Not a lot. I mean, uh, it just shifts that timing around. So, I mean, I don't think you need to, need to show a difference in the budget. If we do it that way, it's just breaking timing up of when we're offering the zero fare period. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm sorry. well, yeah, I mean, but the, it affect, yeah, like rather than zero fares all affecting fiscal year 25, they affect 7.5. So do you still want to see that third option when it comes sense. back to us? I think that, yeah, we want some. Okay. Uh, and then the question I would have back to you, what, what would the time be? So if we do the first six months starting in September, when is the second six months? Is it March leading us to the 26? Uh, six months, yeah. yeah. Come back in a year. Yes. Director <laughs> 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 Atkins. Right, okay. In the meantime, I'll move that we publish the budget for public comment. Okay, I still need to go to public comment, but I will. Can we have a second for the sake of sure? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Did that cover? Did you catch that? Um, Director Atkins. Um, okay, we will open this now for public comment. I just want to talk about a couple of things to give you some more context on this. So for reduced fare, I just went ahead and I looked forward. Um, it's a 60K cost to deal with the collection of fares per year as far as what we have to pay for security and collection. So that's a bit of what the offset is there. Um, as far as equity, currently today, we run 197 routes per day through the university campus. That compares to 65 through the entirety of Watsonville, not considering the one and two. So when we're talking about that fee, that's what you're paying for. It's not per person getting on the bus. It's the triple service that you have over something. Here. So we keep talking about fair, 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 and it used to be that way. And I think that's why we have that stuck in our head that it used to be I think it was like a dollar eighty or something like that per button push. That's not the case anymore. Now it's just you're paying for that pure service rather than each one that gets on. Because we're not counting a billing you per ride. We're billing you for the actual whole route that goes through. So if the university wanted to change that, you wouldn't be able to continue having those two hundred routes per day. It, it's really what Metro pays for it is equitable across the board. You are buying more than that. In the same way that Watson will could come in and say, hey. We want to buy 10 million in service. That's what you're doing. So those are the two actual things I'd say to this. I think we should talk a little bit more about reduction and also ease of fair collection, because right now our structure doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, seven for 17, four for paracruz, two for fixed route, but sometimes discounts work, sometimes they don't, sometimes IDs work, sometimes they don't. I think that reduction can keep us collecting some fare, but also have a major benefit to the public. So I think something in the middle would probably be better than all or nothing. Thank you. Any further public comment? Do you have any online? We do not. All right, we'll bring it back to the board. We have a motion in a second. Is there any further comments or questions? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll do a roll call. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colontary Johnson? Aye. Director Conant? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. 
Director Pegler. Aye. Director Kiros Carter. Aye. And Director Rocker. Aye. The motion passes. Great. Thank you. Moving right along, uh, CEO oral report. Exciting uh, first board meeting. Can I just have to? Uh, you don't have to. Okay. If you'd like to, you're welcome to. But you don't have to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Excited to be here. Uh, so, we'll go over a few things. We have uh, five new employees that uh, started on the 29th. Uh, we have uh, Greg Nolan, who's going to be a maintenance trainer. He was previously with us here, uh, left in 2019, and we're ha happy to have him back. Uh, uh, Abel, Abel, uh, Arambula uh, is a mechanic, and then Isaac Hernandez uh, and Saul Acosta, Acosta who are uh, paratransit operators. Uh, we have two promotions. Uh, we have two new transit supervisors, and uh, that is Jose Caranco and uh, Adrian Jimenez. I'm going to have to practice my pronunciations. <laughs> yeah, we also have received uh, a number of awards for our One Right at a Funding uh, campaign, thanks to Danielle. Uh, we have uh, three Platinum Awards. Uh, we have four Hermes Creative Awards. We've received three Platinum Awards and one Gold Award from that. And we also received a Platinum Level Epic Award from the uh, the cap, which I looked up, it's the California Association of Public Information Officers uh, award we received this week. So, uh, really fantastic campaign, and it's been uh, well recognized. So, want to uh, congratulate that. Uh, well, we kind of I don't want to kick a dead horse with this SB 125 funding. Uh, I think we've talked through it uh, and we're aware of what's at stake for it, so I won't uh, delve a lot deeper into it. We've, I think our meetings with the uh, legislative staff have been good. Uh, and they heard uh, our case. Uh, we've had, uh, sounds like we've had some real great support from our unions, but we'll have uh, reached out to legislators to help them understand the impact. And it's, this does not just affect Santa Cruz. This affects all transit systems in California. So uh, it's it's a big deal. And uh, I'm sure that they, they are hearing from it heavily in the system. So, uh, I'm at the end of week three, and, I have, uh, yeah. and I'm so happy that uh, you selected me to be here. It's been a great experience so far. I'm really looking forward to not traveling uh, back home every weekend. Uh, yeah, this 14 hours of travel, be home for 35 hours is kind of wearing, uh, but only have another month of it, and then uh, everybody will be down here. Uh, but I feel really fortunate. I always worry about coming in, you know, kind of like, what am I going to inherit, like, as far as staff? Uh, but we have a fantastic professional staff that just, uh, you know, uh, give me confidence and give me uh yeah, I'm at ease, I guess. They know what they're doing. Uh, they're able to, they're professionals. And that's exactly what I need because I am, like I said, I'm just a general manager. I know generally a little bit about everything. So I need these experts in, in place to, to help run this system. A lot of moving pieces, uh, but we do a lot of good for our community. And uh, I'm really excited about seeing where we'll be heading here in the next few years. That's the end of my report. Hey, Any questions? Any public comments on the CEO report? Any online? All right. Uh, well, then we'll bring it back to the board, and we are at the end of our meeting. So, oh, yes. Oh, so I'm sorry. Thank you. Board, we have uh, one more board comment. I forgot to uh, make this announcement at the start, but we are having the groundbreaking of Pacific Station North on Monday. Um, the information's on the city website, but it's from noon to three and uh, 902 Pacific Avenue. And from noon to two, the grand baking event will happen, and lunch is included. And um, two to three will be site tours of Pacific Station South and Cedar Street Apartments. And this is all 100% affordable housing. So I hope to see some of your faces there. Great, thank you.
Uh, with that, uh, we will we we will what? We will adjourn to our next scheduled <laughs> <laughs> meeting uh, Friday, June twenty eighth at nine a.m. here in the Metro uh, offices. Until then, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Have a good weekend. Very good.